All right. So we were on exponents. So for example, if I did not do the R cubed first, so if I took four thirds and times it by pi and then times it by R and then times that by R and times that by R, we're gonna get a different number because I'm multiplying this by that and then again by that and again by that, which doesn't work. So that's why we want this cubed first before we multiply by that, okay? It's just the sequence of operation that I'm trying to get to. You know, when I record these sessions, I really got to watch my language now. So thanks for that. It's important. So does anybody know what the D and the M stand for? Yes, you do. Division and multiplication. It's just in the order that they appear. So if I go three divided by four times it by five, we just do it in the sequence that it appears. And we just type it out in our calculator. It's not a big deal. And then the A and the S is addition and subtraction. And we do those in the order that they appear. So that was just a little quick version of that. We're, we're not, uh, let me just clear the screen. Or actually I can just move it over. Is everybody okay with that right now? Good? All right. The next thing I wanna talk about is STP. Does anybody know what STP means? Not no, stone standard. temple pilots. Say it again. Go ahead. Standard temperature pressure. Standard temperature and pressure. So we do all of our mathematical calculations in standard temperature and pressure. Um, so let's uh, talk about standard temperature. Does anybody know what the standard temperature is? Anybody? Okay, I can tell you because I don't like silence, right? It's just one of my weird things. And I will fill in all the gaps. 15.5 degrees Celsius is standard temperature. Now, when you're at the gas pumps and you're filling up your car right below where the dollar sign is, and as it ticks away, you will see something that says volume corrected to 15 degrees C. They want to sell you that fuel at a standard temperature because, as you know, in math and science, Temperature and pressure affect all matter in which state exists. Yes, it affects everything. So they want to sell you that fuel at a standard temperature. Because if they don't, then the volume changes. Yes, gets expands and contracts. It's just like us. We expand and contract with heat and cold. Just ask George Costanza. Now, I don't know if anybody caught that reference, but that's an old one. Okay, or 15 degree, 15.5 degrees C or 60 degrees Fahrenheit is the imperial uh, conversion of that temperature. So all of our calculations will be based upon standard temperature unless otherwise told. Now, what about pressure? What is standard pressure? Does anybody know? 14.7. Uh, 14.7 PSIA. And the A stands for absolute or atmospheric. atmospheric. Now, the standard temp uh, pressure, this is taken at sea level. This is the weight of the atmosphere that is on us at 
sea level, right? So we need a couple of other ones here. Does anybody know the uh, metric equivalent of 14.7? 80 PSI. Uh, metric. Metric is actually KPA. 101 KPA. That's right. 101 KPA is the metric equivalent of 14.7 PSI. So I could say that one PSI is equal to about 6.9 KPA. All right. Now we need a couple of more pressures. Sometimes we calculate pressure, and I don't know why in inches of mercury. Does anybody know the equivalent inches of mercury to sea level pressure? 29. 29.92. And I'm going to call that inches HG. And HG is mercury. All right, it's the chemical symbol for mercury on the periodic table of elements. Now there is a metric equivalent to the 29.92 inches, and that is 760 millimeters. Hg is the metric equivalent to 29.92 inches. And do you remember the old story how they got 29.92 inches? Does anybody remember that story, how that happened? Well, what happened? It was this, this, there was this guy, his name is Torricelli. That was his name. I don't know why it was always Italian guys coming up with it. They were, must have been smarter than everybody else. I don't know why, just they were. And what he did is he took a bowl and he filled it with mercury. He filled it all up with mercury. And then he put a tube in there and he closed off the end and he filled that tube full of mercury too. And what he did then is that he put his thumb over the bottom and he stuck it in there and it stayed up at a level of 29.92 inches, because he determined that the pressure pushing down on the mercury kept that mercury up in that tube at 29.92 inches. And then he went up a big mountaintop. So what he did is he took his little device he made here and he went and he climbed the mountains. And as he climbed the mountains, this pressure started to, started to drop. There was less pressure. He determined that there's less pressure at higher elevations. And so he determined that sea level would be at 29.92 inches. And he also noticed another thing is that when he was back on the ground at sea level at 29.92 inches, these big black clouds came over the horizon and it started raining and lightning started coming down, you know, that sort of thing. And he noticed that this also went down. So when this big storm came over, the pressure actually got lower. So he determined that low pressure on his little device here, he could predict the weather. So what he made, really, what we now know as the barometer. And they predict weather according to the barometer, right? Now, you're wondering, Doug, who cares? I mean, it's a, some Torricelli guy about a couple of centuries ago. You know, no big deal. But Weather prediction is, is pretty important. I mean, especially when I go golfing, I really want to know the weather before I go outside. Can I ask you something dumb then? Certainly. Okay, so if I'm on the top of a mountain, my, wow. ear, my ears pop. Like, isn't that because like, the pressure is high? The pressure is lower. That's what makes your ears pop? Yes. 
Yeah. And then when you go back down the mountain, the pressure increases and you can get ear popping again. Okay. Okay. So this is why we need to know about pressure. And, and this is going to be important, not really for this year, but for next year, when we start talking about gas theory. So I'm going to tell you that from zero to 2000 feet, and this is zero, this is sea level. This elevation right here is considered sea level. From 2000 feet to 4,500 feet above sea level, it's considered high altitude. And anything above 4,500 and above is also considered extra high altitude, but we, won't, we don't call it that. It's still high altitude. But here's the thing. When we're in gas theory, we need to know these elevations because things burn differently at higher elevations. Things burn hotter with less pressure. Okay. Does anybody know the altitude at which Calgary, Alberta is? Does anybody know? Kilometer. Uh, it is 3,400 feet above sea level. Calgary is about 3,400 feet above sea level. We are considered to be in high altitude. Every appliance. And I'm talking about gas burning appliances. Has to be rated for high altitude in southern Alberta. So we're going to take a quick break. And what you're going to do, I'm going to ask you to do something. Now, you may or may not, I mean, depending on where you live or what's going on, but as plumbers and gas fitters, I want you to go to your mechanical room. If you're able, like if you live in an apartment, you have no access to gas burning appliance, that's fine. But if you have access to a gas burning appliance, I want you to go and check what I'm gonna call the rating plate. And I want you to check to see if it is rated for high altitude. So that's your first assignment is to find a gas burning appliance, find the rating plate and see if it's rated for high altitude and I will see you at 9 a.m. So do that and I'll see you at nine o'clock. All right, sounds good? Okay, go check it out.
every appliance in Southern Alberta has to be rated for high altitude. Now, having said that, does anybody know the altitude at Fort McMurray? No? Here, I'm gonna write it down right here. 600 feet. Fort McMurray is considered to be at sea level. So as we travel north, we're actually going downhill. Yeah, it's kind of weird. You know, we have athletes, world-class athletes, like to train in Calgary because of the high altitude here. Because you have less oxygen, and so you have to work harder to do the same things. So that's why we have training facilities here. Um, my golf ball flies farther here in Calgary than it does in Vancouver. Here in Calgary, I can hit the ball 300 yards, no problem off the tee. But when I'm in Vancouver, it's like 250. I don't understand how that works, but it's the weight of the atmosphere that, that does that. Okay, It's just not me feeling weak. Actually, when I go to Vancouver, I feel a lot stronger. I have more energy. I have more air. And it, I feel better when I go to sea level atmospheres. It's kind of cool. All right. So the next pile of numbers that we need to be concerned about is one. Uh, let me just start off with one cubic foot of water. Does anybody know how much one cubic foot of water weighs? Does anybody remember that number? Uh, 62.4 pounds. 62.4 pounds. Now, I could write this in a little bit different way. I could say there's 62.4 pounds in one cubic foot, and that is for water. And we call this a density of water, don't we? And the density, um, if I wanted to make a density of, um, define what density is, it is a mass per unit of volume. And then you can see a mass is in pounds, and a unit of volume in cubic feet. So water has a density of 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Does anybody know how much water weighs per cubic inch? 6.24. 0 0.0361 pounds per cubic inch. One cubic inch of water weighs that much. That's another number that you need to remember. How about, while well, we're talking about densities of water, how about metrically? Does anybody know how much one cubic meter of water weighs? How about 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter of water? Remember that number. That's a density of water. There's another density that we kind of need to be concerned about moving forward is one imperial gallon. One imperial gallon of water weighs how much? Does anybody remember? 10 pounds is one in gallon of water. So I can say that it is 10 pounds per gallon. And that is imperial measure. And as you can see, it's a mass per unit of volume. A gallon is a unit of volume. And we also need to know the US equivalent of that number. Does anybody remember what a US gallon weighs? 8.33 pounds per gallon, and that is U.S., 
And why do we have to know what the US has? Does anybody know why? Because America built. Because they have more guns than us. Not true. It's because they're our biggest trading partner, right? So we buy a lot of materials. We buy a lot of equipment, especially pumps, that sort of thing from them. So they have their own measurement, right? So we need to know a couple of these. Um, and now not, a, these are still densities of water, but not a density of water, uh, 6.24 gallons per cubic foot oh i didn't i spelled that wrong sorry yeah 6.24 gallons per cubic foot imperial measure and 7.5 gallons per cubic foot for us that's um, another number that you should know uh you have to learn how to do screenshot or whatever you know you could always screenshot these uh if you okay. want yeah okay so more numbers that you need to know there is 12 inches in one foot is there not right there's 12 inches in a foot yeah, yeah we we know that so in one square foot there is 144 square inches. Is, is that not correct? Pretty sure. And there's also 1,728 cubic inches in a cubic foot. So if I was to draw a square, oh, beautiful. And this is 12 inches by 12 inches. That's one foot by one foot. So that's one foot squared or 144 inches squared, right? Length times width is area. We know that. So to uh, expand upon that, if I had that square again and I made that square a cube, and that was 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. That is 1,728 cubic inches or one cubic foot. And I filled up this one cubic foot box with water. It would weigh 62.4 pounds, just the water, right? We know that? Yes, yes, yes. Excellent. Now, I want to give you a little bit more. So one meter has 1,000 millimeters, right? We know that. So one meter has 100 centimeters. We, we know that. And then one meter has 10 decimeters. We know that, right? One liter is equal to one kilogram. We know that. We should know that. Um, one cubic meter has one million cubic centimeters. Right? We know that. Okay, there's a lot of numbers, isn't there? I'm going to start um, a little bit of calculations with you guys. And just, this is so such quick review on some of this stuff. For example, if I had less than one inch, if I had 0.5, five inches and I wanted to make that into a fraction, right? We know that that is a half inch, do we not? We know that intuitively, right? Or six, 
six inches is 0 0.5 feet, right? And we use these little acronyms for feet, and this is, this is for inches, this is for feet, right? We, we normally do that sometimes. You may want to then just put feet in there or inches, something like that, just to define it correctly. Um, so, for example, if I had 0 0.125 inches and I wanted you to make that into a fraction in eighths, the way we do this is we take the decimal of inches, we multiply it by the denominator that we want it in, and the answer is, oh, that's not right. So if I take my calculator and go 0.125 and times by eight, the answer is my oops, numerator, right? So that's the quick conversion of fractions from decimals of inches. Let me do another one of those. If I had 0 0.625 inches, and I wanted that to the nearest 16th, I would take my 0.625 and multiply that by my denominator. And the answer is my numerator. And if both are divisible by a number, we can reduce that down to 5 eighths. That's just a quick conversion of decimal of inches into fractions. All right. I'm not going to talk much more about that. But what I want to get to is a formula triangle. We use formula triangles a lot. There is a formula triangle booklet under the handouts in D2L for you to download, print, do whatever you want with it. But for example, I'm going to start talking about pressure. Okay. And as plumbers and gas fitters, it's important for us to know how to calculate pressures. We need pressures of gases and fluids and everything. This is important to us. This is part of our job. And how we calculate pressure, pressure would be on the top of this formula triangle. And the pressure is in PSI or it is in KPA. That's typically how we calculate pressure. And pressure, if I was to define pressure, pressure's definition is force um, what is the let me I, I'm having a little bit of a brain thing. Force uh, times no, it's not force times area. Let me just erase that. I'll erase that a little bit. It is force. <laughs> Does anybody know? Or continue? No? The height. Area. Height density. Yeah. Area. <clears throat> it's force area. per unit of area. It's force per unit of area. So then force, definition of force is work done. It's a push. It's a pull. And we express force. We express it in pounds or metrically newtons. So if we express force in pounds, per unit of area, force is pounds per unit of area. So that means pounds, pounds per square inch. Force per unit of area, pounds per square inch. Yeah, so there you go. And pressure, static pressure, 
If I'm talking about water pressure, we talk about hydrostatic pressure. And hydro means water, static means non-moving, static. It's like a city worker, doesn't move, right? Non-moving, so we calculate pressure according to height, right? And then we multiply it by the density of water if we're talking about hydrostatic pressure. Now, with that formula triangle, if I'm talking about height in inches, we multiply the height of the water in inches by 0 0.0361 PSI per inch, and that will give me my pressure. If we're talking about feet of water, we multiply by 0 0.433 PSI per foot, and that will give me my pressure. If we're talking about meters of water, we multiply by 9.81 kPa per meter, and that gives me my pressure. If we're talking about inches of mercury, then we multiply by 0 0.491 PSI per inch of mercury, and that will give me my pressure. And there is another one if we talk about inches of water and we want ounces, 0 0.578 ounces per inch of water, and that will give me my pressure. So those are some numbers that you need to know and to memorize. Now, I'm sure that you guys learned about what a BTU is. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know what a BTU is? I'm looking, for the, I'm looking for the definition. So this is a British thermal unit. And really, it's a measurement of heat. And what this measurement is, it is um, how much heat? Do you want the definition word for word? Yeah, is required. I think I got it. To raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. A BTU is imperial measure. It's an imperial measurement, but it's how much heat is required to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. Now, when we start talking about BTUs, it is also how much heat is being used. We talk a little bit about BTUs when we talk about inputs and outputs. So an output divided by an input would give us a percent in efficiency. Now, we this is from first year and this is really a percentage kind of formula as well. It's the same as percentages where the part and the whole. So the part divided by the whole would equal our percentage. For example, if I had an input of an appliance that was 100,000 BTUs per hour, and I said that this appliance was 78% efficient, what is my output? 
So we use this formula triangle to say the input times the efficiency is equal to the output. So this appliance would have 78,000 BTUs as output, meaning we're only getting 78,000 BTUs into our uh, heating space or into the water or whatever we're heating. The rest is lost through jacket and stack losses, right? Because we, when we burn gas, we have all this combustion taking place and we have all these flue gases and vent gases peeling off. So nothing is 100% efficient at gas burning appliances. Um, can I stop you for a moment and ask a question? Sure thing. Okay, so when you did this uh, 100,000 BTUs an hour and then 78% efficiency, you just, the smaller number, you just times. So that was my input. So yeah. there's input right here. Yes, sir. And then we times it by the efficiency. So there's the efficiency. So this way is multiply, this way is divide. Okay. Okay. Perfect. And we could use that also for percentage where we can have the part, the whole and percentage. So for example, if I had a test and I got three out of five, what was my percentage? 60%. So you go three divided by five. So the part divided by the whole is equal to 0 0.6. And to make that a percentage, I must remind you that you times it by 100 to get it as a percentage. Is that a pass, by the way, at SAIT? No. No, it's not. So we don't want to see any of these on our- 99% is a pass. <laughs> 65 for SAIT. And your final mark has to be uh, 70 combined total above 70%. All right. So when we get to densities, we know density. We have a formula triangle as well for that. And it's mass divided by volume is equal to density. We could find out my density as well. We could, we could say how dense is Doug. Well, let, wait a second. That didn't come out right. We could say, okay, for example, I weigh about 170 pounds. Okay, I was a little, you know, COVID hasn't been great to me, but you know, it's the way it is. And my volume just happens to be two cubic feet. Okay, because that's my height and width and length all multiplied together and I'm about two cubic feet. So what is my density? Can anybody figure that out? Eight point five. I'm what? Eighty five. Eight point five. Oh, eighty five. 85 pounds per cubic foot. Okay, that's my density. So let me just put it this way. Am I heavier than water? Am I heavier than water? No. Yeah, I'm heavier than water because water's density is what? 62.4, yes? Okay, so guess what happens when I get into a swimming pool? You'll die. <laughs> I sink when I'm in a swimming pool. I sink to the bottom. And I have friends that are a lot bigger than me, a lot heavier than me that float. But I sink when I get into a swimming pool. It's because my density is heavier than water. 
And once I know my density, I can find out my relative density, how many times heavier that I am from water. So I could just do this, multiply by the, or divide by the density of water, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And that would give me my relative density. So let me do that. Divided by 62.4. My relative density is 1.36. So I am 1.36 times heavier than water. And that's why I, I sink when I get into a fresh water swimming pool. It's crazy. Now, when I get into a pool, a salt water pool, and they have those out there, because salt water is way more dense than fresh water, I tend to float in salt water, right? So when we're doing any calculation, we're going to assume we're using fresh water, okay? Any calculation according to densities or relative densities, or buoyancy, we're gonna talk about fresh water, All right? So Doug's not very buoyant. I am not buoyant. I sink, it's terrible. All right, so that's a little lesson on relative density and buoyancy all in one shot. Pretty cool, eh? pretty good, pretty good. What else do we need to know? There's all kinds of things that you still need to know, but that's, that's pretty good so far. Let me just uh, stop sharing for a second.